Welcome back and thank you very much for your time. The Ghanaian Times this morning says government inaugurates energy sector recovery program steering committee. Foreign Affairs Ministry reacts to Times story on Nigeria border closure. And uh, man, nine, man gets nine years for defiling girl. The big banner headline is the president telling us not to stigmatize infertile women according to uh, a program that was held yesterday by the Meg Foundation. Congratulations to our own Portia Gabo here, to Ajoa Dubia Usu and to AC Binua too for picking up uh, awards there at that award ceremony. The Finder newspaper, accident deaths dropped by 7.6%. 1,580 people killed in nine months compared to 1,710 last year. Stop stigmatizing women with infertility issues. President, action plan to replace PDS out by November 15. Finance Minister. Daily Guide, vote buying rocks parliament. How so? We'll tell you more. Flood course Havoc in Accra, Kumasi. I made economy good, President Mahama says so. And don't worry, barren women. The Daily Graphic. Reduce tax exemptions. It will increase revenues. Economists suggest to government. And yesterday, Issa did their own state of the economy at the University of Ghana. All we want are our investment. Men's gold customers demand. Graphic. Malcolm strengthening business relationships. And uh, the GRA probes companies tax compliance. My guest this morning to help with the conversation is Madame Rose Rodling Imorayana. She's a former second vice chair of the Convention People's Party. Madam, good morning. Good Welcome. Morning. Good to see you. Been a while. Yeah, I took a short break. <laughs> I see. <laughs> and also Gabriela Tete is a member of the NDC's communication team. Welcome. Thank good you. to see you. Good to have you again. Good to be here. How's it going? Wednesday morning? So far good. so good. Shari morning, but it's good. Ah, don't worry, we'll be fine. Yesterday, the president, and, and I'll start with you because um, you, you're a woman. Yesterday, the president um, at the program said that the <clears throat> stigma against women who are infertile, especially culturally, I mean, somebody gets married, they're hoping that she'll start bearing fruits and she, she doesn't bear fruits and the family pressure from everywhere. Um, these days, pastors are here buffing for people's wives um, just to make sure that they are fertile and all of that. What, what's your own view of what the president says, Gabriel, I'll start with you, about not worrying women uh, who are barren? Well, good morning to your viewers. Good morning, madam. Um, you know, in our culture, to put a cultural context, as you already started with the introduction, there's a lot of pressure on young people when they get married. Mm -hmm. After, without getting mm -hmm. married, uh, when you get to a certain age, mm -hmm. It's expected that you should start producing children. Because we live in a country where people think that having kids is actually an, a sign of accomplishment, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, and a mark of success. Right. When it actually isn't so. There are a lot of stigmatization, there's a lot of pressure on females who are unable to have kids. Mm -hmm. But society also doesn't <laughs> take lightly to the fact that there are some people who probably are just predisposed to not wanting kids. Mm -hmm. You know, those people do exist. Mm -hmm. There are some who probably wish for adoption. Okay. There are some who have other um, siblings mm -hmm. and that they also take care of. So I think that the pressure sometimes is a bit unwarranted mm -hmm. and that if we keep the education going, that is a choice. Okay. So there's, there's an issue of barrenness, yes. Mm -hmm. it, it's a medical condition. But we're talking general terms right. here. Now, on, in, on barrenness itself, these days there's a lot of research and advancement mm -hmm. in technology to mm -hmm. help families procreate. Right. You can go for surrogacy. Mm -hmm. You can have uh, in vitro many options mm -hmm. available. So I think that it's just a matter of time okay. for some of those technologies to work for people. Mm -hmm. And we just have to bear them. It's very difficult when mm -hmm. society puts pressure on people, expecting them to give birth, mm -hmm. and they are not. And sometimes the stress alone mm -hmm. will actually not let you produce the hormones you need to, 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 to procreate. Mm -hmm. So I think what you, what you said was actually right. Okay. And Rhoda, is, is it a question of these women who find themselves in this situation of infertility, 
who put themselves up for stigmatization and public ridicule. Because sometimes somebody, like somebody says, some of them talk too much. They, they tell everybody what their problem is, even when they are not being asked to, to explain. Good morning, Ghana. Um, I don't think that it's the women. It's, it's just society. Mm -hmm. um, when you meet your peers, mm -hmm. you know, after a while, the first thing they ask is, oh, hi, how are you? So are you married? Right. How many children do you have? Mm. You understand? So that alone is enough to, to, to kind of like wake you up. Okay. And um, at the end of the day, they, they, they talk a lot about it because people ask too many questions. Mm. If you didn't ask me whether I had kids or when am I going to have kids, okay. I wouldn't bother saying that I don't have kids. Right. But then you, you, you meet people and mm. the first thing that they want to know is whether you have kids or not. Mm. So that alone is too much pressure. Mm -hmm. Then also the culture. The culture is that when you get married, like mm. you said, the, the basic thing is we're marrying because we want to have kids. Okay. But that's not the truth. Because some people do marry and they, they decide mm -hmm. for various reasons not to have kids. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the time, it's always the woman who is to be blamed, not the man. You understand? So the, the, the men go scot-free, sort of. And it's the women who always have to bear the brand. But why? Because somehow it's the women that, is, that are seen. When pregnancy comes, it's you. But okay. if, the, if the man is not able to perform, it's between you and the man. Mm. <laughs> Society doesn't know that. You understand? Right. And, and most of the time, as women, we try to protect the, 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 the men. Mm -hmm. A lot of the times, some women really go through this supposed infertility or barrenness okay. because their men cannot perform. And, and they have refused and to, they have to ref attend to that's medical... It. And, and they also will not want to admit even to their closest family members okay. that it, the problem is me. Mm. You understand? Mm. We've had situations where the men would say that, look, why don't you go out and bring the children and I'm fine. Mm -hmm. You know, it's only these days of DNA, maybe when you want to travel, that you, it might come out that the kids do not belong not to the man. Yes. Mm. So it's, it's part of that. So I think that if we want to stop um, the stigmatization, mm -hmm. then we must also stop asking those questions. Okay. You, 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 you go for parliamentary vetting. How did you hear the men being asked, how many children do you have? Right. But it's always the women. Right. Are you married? Do you have kids? And that seems to be something, mm. you understand? Mm. It shouldn't be. Um, uh, we, we are looking at situations where in a society, if you don't have them, it means that you, you're not complete. Mm. And you, you ask yourself, look at Theresa May. She didn't have any kids, but she mm. is. Mm. She was the prime minister of the, the, of the UK. Right. Does it mean that she, she, she couldn't manage that country or something? You understand? So it, relevance. It, yeah, to, relevance. To, it, to it, your it, it can be by choice. Mm. It can be by choice. And we must rather um, sympathize with people who are barren. There's a okay. difference between being infertile and being mm. barren, right, you understand? Right. So we must sympathize with them. Okay, and uh, you can join us with your thoughts and comments, 020 216 uh, We'll go to the University of Ghana shortly because the uh, economists at the University of Ghana are asking for um, government to, um, and the University of Ghana called on governments to be bold and take difficult decisions to unlock the potential of the economy. Academics and research fellows at the Institute of Statistical, Social and Economic Research, ISA at the University of Ghana, said the outlook of the Ghanaian economy was bright, uh, but difficult decisions such as slashing tax exemptions, um, increasing tax revenues, and target social interventions better would propel the economy into higher performance. Import exemptions, for example, fell uh, on the international trade fell from uh, to 24.8 percent and 19.2 uh, percent of total revenue in 2016 and 2017, respectively. But in 2018, exemptions on imports increased to 33.6 percent and of the total revenue from international trade, from translating to some 2 million, uh, 2.047 billion of. Uh, 6.102 billion realized for international trade. The, but the, the critical one for me will be the, um, the community development, the angle of community development. And I will want us to focus the conversation this way. There's been a lot of talk about our economy looking very good on paper. Um, the economists at the University of Ghana are asking for the government to take very bold decisions. Um, the revenue targets that we have set for ourselves over time, we have not been able to meet it. 
at least from 2017. And they're saying, look, take bold decisions. What's your take on that? Actually, I do agree with them because um, if you watch the data mm -hmm. from 2017 to 2019, the current administration has brought heavily mm -hmm. to fund infrastructure projects. Um, I think they've already done about 85 billion in borrowings, mm -hmm. five billion in grants. Oil, 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 and extractives have brought in about six billion. Mm -hmm. They've not been able to meet revenue targets. I, as you yourself have mentioned, um, mobilize revenue domestically. But the question is, even with what they've been able to accrue, mm. what really do you really see for what they've been able to accrue? They're not spent on capital infrastructure projects, a lot of it is in consumption, recurrent expenses. And for you to propel growth, mm. you have to have investments in capital infrastructure. Mm. Oil and gas, yes, and it's producing, it's bearing fruit. It's one of our best growing sectors. Mm -hmm. But the oil and extractives is also in, it's, it's largely foreign led okay. and not in the hands of Ghanaians. If you come down to uh, household levels, mm -hmm. incomes haven't changed in most households. We have issues of joblessness because of, as we already are aware, the financial services mm -hmm. clean up. We have, um, companies that had to fold up because they were producing services that were supporting the financial but, services. But the inflation the has also. come down on the paper. IMF <laughs> says we're doing very well. You see, when you don't spend, mm. when the government doesn't spend, there isn't enough liquidity moving in the system. Okay. So spending from the consumer angle is also lessened. And that alone has a way of curbing, bringing down, controlling inflation. Right. It's about the liquidity in the system. Okay. So on paper, it will look good. Mm -hmm. But when you come down to you and I, our everyday pa pa, -pa movement, mm -hmm. you can see that it's, it's not all well and good. Okay, so they're talking about uh, the reduction of tax exemptions and the economists w had a problem with the widespread of tax exemptions that, oh, we're cutting it here, we're cutting it here. And yet the same people who the taxes are being cut for say they can't, they can't really feel it. Is it a question of economic dishonesty, or is it the, the fact that government is not really, really scratching the people where they itch? You have, they gave us some tax exemption on income, income tax exemptions when they came to office. Mm. Subsequently, they did some reductions in utilities. Right. They've increased utilities. Mm -hmm. So if you bring down taxes and incomes remain the same, your disposable income has gone up somewhat. But when you have additional uh, costs being incurred, mm. then what really is there is a benefit you are getting your minimum uh, wage raised by january oh. we still have three months into january okay and a lot can happen in three months they can still decide to like, increase the utilities again they can decide that they are going to increase fuel again and mm -hmm. it's all adds up to pressure on the consumer on the issue of exemptions mm -hmm. you know gipc has this whole exemption regime to attract fdis right which is a good thing because we believe that we're able to bring in foreign investors, there'll be transfer of technology, mm. transfer of knowledge. Mm. We've learned this since, since JSS. But is that really happening? So is the exemption regime really making an impact mm. to the ordinary Ghanaian? No, because the regime is tailored more to foreign um, investors than domestic investors. But, but if you're a domestic investor and you don't, um, uh, for example, register with a GIPC, you have shot yourself in the foot to, to have been scaled away from that uh, exemption, don't you think? True, but we, we, we have a, a country that is predominantly informally um, dispensed. Hmm. And the informal economy isn't a structured economy okay. where you have a system and you say we're going to register with GIPC, but registering with GIPC has its own conditions that you have to follow. Okay. You have to have a registration regime, you have to put on your taxes, you have to have, it's a very formal structure for mm -hmm. you to assess GIPC. Mm -hmm. Same with other state institutions. Mm -hmm. But when you come into the informal economy, where things are done more or less anyhow, okay. It's the conditions are not the same. Now, on the again, on the issue of exemptions, mm -hmm. I also think that as the 
research or, um, indicated. There's a whole lot of pressure on our economy because we, the, the exemption regime just makes us lose so much revenue. Mm -hmm. there are these companies, when they produce in this country, if we didn't have the tax, if we did not have the tax regime okay. that we do have currently, mm -hmm. I'm very sure that we're able to mobilize the revenue that we need. Mm -hmm. There are companies that have been in this country who are given exemptions under the guise that they are going to end up producing in Ghana. Right. Unfortunately, they've been under the regime for 10 years mm -hmm. without even setting up any proper production infrastructure in Ghana. And, and so it the defeats, repatriations are happening. And the repatriations are happening. So it defeats the purpose of the... Um, Okay, local mobilization. Let's uh, welcome Nana Damwa. Nana Damwa speaks for the MPP. He is also with the Energy Ministry. Nana, welcome. How are you Thank doing? You. I'm very well. Good, good to see well. you. Good to see you too. Great. Uh, Antiroda, take a bite on this one. Professor Kwati yesterday uh, had mentioned that the time had come for the government to prioritize domestic revenue mobilization and be disciplined in expenditure to firm up the hope of a robust economy. In particular, he underscored the need for critical review of the tax exemption regimes to rake in the needed resources for national development. The government, by its own dictate, says they have uh, passed a law to put a cap on uh, overspending, some 5%. What would be your review of that, putting it in tandem with what Professor Kwate is saying, local revenue mobilization and all? You know, like, um, like my colleague said, if you are not spending, definitely things are not going to move. Mm -hmm. And um, in our type of situation where we have a, an economy that is basically informal, mm -hmm. yeah? And um, you're looking around and you realize that we do not even have that much mm -hmm. to offer. We don't have industries that produce that are Ghanaian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, most of the things that we produce here are semi-produced in the sense that we have to import okay. the raw materials and then we come over here and finish them up. Okay. So at the end of it all, we still do not have what it takes to grow this economy. Mm -hmm. And I would have wished that government spent more time growing the indigenous businesses. But unfortunately, um, indigenous businesses are not doing well. What's the problem? Um, the reason is that getting um, capital, for mm -hmm. instance, mm -hmm. is a problem. Um, you go to the banks, the interest rates, even though people will tell you that it's come down, it's not available because of the things that you're required to produce. Mm. Um, you're required to produce some form of collateral. Right. Some of them do not have that kind of collateral. Mm. And therefore what happens is that you just make a do with whatever little capital you have. Now that can't grow, especially in a situation where the, the dollar rates keeps, in, you know, um, going up and down, fluctuating, and then you also do know that um, the, the people's spending power has really gone down. Mm -hmm. In the sense that there's, there's so much unemployment in the system, okay. our wages and salaries are nothing to write home about if mm -hmm. you compare it to other countries, mm -hmm. and then you expect that these people will be able to save. You, you get me? Okay. Um, they'll be able to. They are not able to save, mm -hmm. and um, the, the social interventions that have been put out by government also mm -hmm. are not targeting the right kind of people. Because if you're doing social interventions such as the lip, and okay. you're just giving to people to spend, they're not producing anything. You, you understand? If you were actually intervening in industry. Assuming that factories had come up and you were intervening in those factories, helping them to grow more, uh, uh, maybe the farmers to grow more mm -hmm. um, uh, 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 fruits or raw materials and stuff like that, then you'd be, you'd be helping yourself. Mm -hmm. But in this situation, if, if you go out now saying that you're going to cut taxes, I mean, mm -hmm. governments actually came um, into being, into governance based on tax exemptions that they were really going to cut off nuisance taxes right. that they have tried to do. It hasn't helped. It means that there is a problem somewhere. And that problem is that people are just not working. People would want to work, but they are not working. And if you're talking about um, <laughs> minimum wage right. uh, coming up in coming January, up in January I, I kept asking myself, why do the trade unions actually accept, you know, that kind of uh, an arrangement where you always tag the, 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 the wage to the next year mm. when you do not know how the, the economy is going to work out for the present year. It, it, it doesn't sound right to me mm. because like we all know, utilities will go up without anybody saying mm. anything. Mm. Then we have energy, the same thing. We have all these things affecting us. Today as we speak, with the floods 
coming. Right. Yeah, and mm -hmm. all that. Mm -hmm. It's affecting a whole lot of businesses. You do not expect to be able to get collect enough taxes mm -hmm. because people are not able to work. To work. You know, right. when it comes to um, major works in construction where mm -hmm. you, you, you spend a lot, mm -hmm. people are not able to do so because of the flood. So how are you going to break even? So it's not a question of taxing us, mm -hmm. but being able to put in place certain measures and mm -hmm. letting the institutions at least be flexible to the Ghanaian, to the indigenous people. Mm -hmm. We are too hard on ourselves, but we sort of like open up to foreigners. You know, you go to the free zone spot, people, um, um, companies will come up for 10 years and after that they, they fold up and come out again as Whose new Whose job is it to watch them? The free zone spot is there, uh, GIPC is there. They're supposed to be ensuring that once we give you tax holidays, you are giving us something back. You are employing a quantum of your staff from here. You are uh, putting up factories. You're putting up manufacturing avenues. You are paying taxes. You are, whose job is it to maintain and why, why don't we do that? Well, I think there's a director for, for free zones and they are supposed to, and the GRA is supposed to be seeing to these kinds of things, visiting them, looking into their books and stuff like that. We do have problems in the institutions that are supposed to um, supervise these kinds of mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. That is where the problem is. Somehow, there is a disconnect between those um, companies mm -hmm. and those industries and factories that are being run in the Free Zones Board and other places and mm -hmm. our revenue collection uh, agencies mm -hmm. and also um, those that are supposed to license with all these groups. So there is a, a problem. But by, by June, by the close of June this year, that's the second quarter, Greek had risen from 2.2% to 3.1%, we are told. So that's an indication perhaps that planting for food and jobs, rearing for food and jobs is doing something. Even though I don't agree that we are uh, importing 1.3 billion uh, cities worth of rice and we are importing tomatoes and things. But the records will show that it's improved from 2.2 to 3.1. That, that's on paper. That's on paper. I go around looking for uh, made in Ghana rice to buy and you have to go lengths to find made in Ghana rice. And you're asking yourself, what's the planting for food and jobs? Where is the rice? You're looking out for poultry. We're still buying bo boxed poultry from, from God knows where. You understand? It, it takes time for it to come up. Well, it, it, yeah, well, then we shouldn't be having such figures. You say, let's, let's get the real figures. Let's be real. Let's be, every Ghanaian reading this this morning will think that if you go out there, you'll find made in Ghana things or made in Ghana food is cheap. It isn't. You go to the markets these days, you know, until this border was closed, mm. I didn't know that we imported so much from our neighboring countries yeah. by way of vegetables, tomatoes, like tomatoes onions, onions and stuff. Yeah. We import all these things from our neighboring countries. And once Nigeria blocked us, that was it. You enter the markets and the markets are empty. It tells you a whole lot. So where is the uh, planting for food and jobs then? Okay, Nana, step in for me. Uh, welcome. The first one will be, let's start from the agri sector. Because the records that um, Issa is showing us says 2.2, we have risen from that point to 3.1 as of June, second quarter. Uh, the ladies are asking questions. Hey, well, it looks good on paper, but in the markets, and they go to the markets. Do, do, you, do you go to the markets? I do go to the market. <laughs> do you find the, I do. the things? The, um, does it reflect in the markets? Thank you very much. Um, good morning to you. Good morning to your viewers as well. Um, I have listened intently to all that has been said, and I think that... Well, these are opinions that we all have to take together, but then I also think it's imperative that we point out one or two things for, for the benefit of this discussion. First of all, um, the Planting for Food and Jobs initiative is not one that covers everything. Mm -hmm. As you know, as you can understand, it's an initiative that was started in 2017, mm -hmm. and so, there were selected pro um, farm produce that was mm -hmm captured under the planting for food and jobs. As the, as the years have gone by, we've sought to increase it. Now we have planting for export and rural development. We have added other models. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean, our government is not claiming that we've solved all the problems within the agricultural sector in a year or two. What government is saying is that there's a huge gap. You need to make interventions and you need to start from somewhere. So these starting points have shown. And when it is time for, 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 for people to have it, you can see the glut. Now there's an issue with transportation. People are complaining about roads. And as you are aware, 2.2 billion has been released to pay road contractors. And Let, let's do a bit of a break. Professor Kwati says that, look, planting for food and jobs is part of the investment that we've made to see the figures grow. But the over-reliance on uh, donor funding, it brings a question of sustainability that we must look at because if the donors pull out, for example, in giving us fertilizer, seedlings, 
we'll, we'll, we'll be hungry. I agree with him on, on that basis that we should look at sustainability. But you see, the point of sustainability is there's an ongoing discussion. We are, we've started it. It's an intervention. We are not claiming that we've solved all the problems within two days or three days or three years. No. But the point is, there is a huge gap that needs to be filled. And some way, somehow, something has to be done about it. And we are doing something about it. Sustainability, yes, it's a question that will continue to remain. We are finding innovative solutions around it. But today, as we stand, we have plenty for food and we have rearing. We have other models that have come on. How, how do we mm -hmm. ensure, for example, like Madame Roda said, that when Nigeria decides to close their border, Togo closes, every girl closes it. Okay. Maybe we just have the sea available to us. The we point don't is, go hungry. The point is... Now, take out these interventions of planting for food and jobs among others, for which we are raising questions of sustainability. Mm. What would have happened anyway? Now you have at least an intervention. It's an issue of looking at it, mm. the glass being half full or half empty. Mm. You, have, you had an empty glass in the first place. Okay. Now it is half full. Mm. We are not saying that we failed it totally, but we are saying that we are getting there. We can have all of these uh, discussions as we move forward. And uh, do not take me out of context. I mean, it, uh, it is being considered plans are far advanced. Okay. But we have something in there that we are dealing with. Mm. Moving forward, the question of sustainability has to be answered. And it is being answered as we are going along. I've heard some very interesting statistics like, as well yeah. um, about the fact that... Uh, exemptions yeah. yes have grown among others yes i agree with you on all of that we also haven't been able to reach revenue targets i agree with you on all of that i've had a figure it's, of it's not me it's the, the records I, from I've gra of, from ESA. i've had a figure of 85 billion being borrowed and all of that i agree but you see the big challenge that we have and very often you hear it being said that the 85 billion has been on consumption it's arguable but the reality is it is, true like i said it's arguable is it true what did we spend it on like I said, it's <laughs> arguable. What did we spend it on? It's, so, it's arguable. So, you so, are government. Uh, yes, I'm telling you, you that it's arguable. Now, if you me. allow me, government has just recently released 2.2 billion to pay road contractors. Now, listen, it amounts to just about 40 percent of what is owed in the road sector. Roads that have been constructed from 2013, 2014, that have not been paid. Now, these debts are there, and if we talk about liquidity crunch within the economy, they all contribute to it. If you do not pay these contractors, mm. they do not have monies to pay back the people, the banks that have lent what to them. What was the 85 because, billion spent on? And that's what I'm explaining to you, that there were several avenues of it. First of all, um, you can arguably say that the financial sector cleanup was a critical part of it. I've also just mentioned 2.2 billion that went into the road sector, among other avenues. And I'm saying that if... These are critical elements that if government did not pay attention to, we're still going to be in a bigger mess anyway. What government is doing is looking at the entire gamut of it, prioritizing the key areas and moving along with it. You can argue with me as to whether free SHS was an essential thing or not. But in let, the opinion, let, Let's stay in, a, a bit on this. So you're asking I, me... I spoke with some, some contractors regarding the mm -hmm. 2.2 billion. Mm -hmm. And they say that, look, you have owed me money for over three years. If you give me my money today and you are giving me a part of it and expect me to applaud you, my money, first of all, has been devalued. It is no longer worth the amount it was on the market. I owe the banks. They are already taking their money from me as soon as the money hits the account. So essentially, you have not done anything for me. You have just paid me a bit of what you owe me. The banks have taken it away. I can't go back onto the streets if that is what you are looking for, <clears throat> for me to do. And so do more and stop asking for applause. What do you say? I don't think that the essence of these interventions <clears throat> is essentially to ask for applause. The essence of it is to fix the problems as they exist. And listen, room wasn't built in a day. We <clears throat> cannot fix all the problems at once. There are huge problems across the length and breadth of this country. Look, 60 years after independence, <clears throat> people, are still, people still don't have places to ease themselves. We've had to set up a ministry to attempt to solve those problems. Mm -hmm. And even in that, we haven't finished solving all of those problems. So the problems exist. I can understand where they are coming from, that their money has, all those arguments are valid. But be that as it may, mm -hmm. government in every given year accrues only a certain amount of money. Mm -hmm. And whether we like it or not, that constitutes the entirety of the pot. And so if you have people that have been owed since 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016, and government then starts to reduce expenditure in 2017, bearing in mind that there's such a very heavy backlog that needs to be settled. And we have problems with that. 
are we supposed to go on that unsustainable model where there are costs, there are issues, there are debts, and we are still going to go along and expect the same contractors to come and find money some way somehow and overburden them? We haven't paid everything, but we've paid something. And that what, is... What, what do you say to the argument that, look, you stopped contracts uh, or projects ongoing in the name of conducting audit? You found nothing in most of those cases. And in some of those cases, the contracts were reawarded to the same contractors who were holding it. That lame duck period within which the contract was stopped could have completed it. And you know that if you are constructing a road and you stop it and you come back, the exactly. cost doubles, maybe triples. No, you see. So we, we do this to ourselves mm -hmm. and we come back to say we have a lot of problems. No, I disagree with you because you may also want to avert your mind to the fact that the finance minister recently mentioned that I think in the earlier part of the year that when they asked for uh, receivables or payables from, from the various MMDs, mm -hmm. we received a bill of about 10 billion. Mm -hmm. And then upon an audit, we realized that just about 5 billion of it was payable. The rest were just made up. A new government has come into being. Remember also that GIFMIS and all of these uh, you know, technological interventions came in at the latter part mm -hmm. of the NDC regime. A lot of bills were there. Are you just going to go on paying all of these bills without being able to ascertain whether indeed they were genuine or not? I also disagree with you, certainly, on the fact that you say in a lot of these circumstances, nothing were found. Because in a lot of them as well, a lot was found. And that audit, sort of a baseline audit, was necessary. When you look at the handing over notes, you see that there were a lot of issues that were not captured in these matters. And to protect the public press, government needed to take some of these steps that they have taken. Moving forward, we have now ascertained the real bills. And government didn't just do that and sit back. But as you can see, we are, rolling, we are going on to tackle these problems. Secondly, a lot of technology has been introduced into this to ensure mm -hmm. that we don't ever get to that point where due to a lack of records, okay. you need to establish a baseline, uh, baseline audit again mm -hmm. to have these figures again. Today we have GIFMIS. We have all of these things that have been Did, put did they have to take government to halt the contracts to conduct an audit, when you have an audit service, when you have uh, people working at the uh, Roads and Highways Ministry, you have a structure. You have why? Why did we set aside the structure to say we want to conduct an take, audit? Take the Cocoa Roads, for instance, mm -hmm. where a budget was approved, and let's assume that the budget was one billion. Okay. At the end of the day, contracts were awarded to the tune of three billion. That is an irregularity that you cannot condone. Okay. Now. Remember, you are doing these things backed by a budget, backed by finances. If you give these contractors the contract, they'll go out there and go and find the money and do it. When it comes to payment, mm -hmm. then it becomes an issue where three years, four years, five years, six years down the line, nothing has happened. Again, I had the issue of um, an informal economy right. and the fact that a lot of our people are informal, so it makes taxation very difficult. I agree. But that is why interventions like the digital addressing system and the national identification card and all of these things have come into play. Mm -hmm. These are meant to mop up and ensure that we are placing, look, I've seen an advert recently, I think it's a snit mm -hmm. that is saying that they are going cardless because once you obtain mm -hmm. your national ID card, that enables all you need is your snit number embedded in it and we're moving forward. As we go along, we can integrate our passport to it. Now that Ghana Revenue Authority has also added this thing, mm -hmm. uh, th so it will be linked to your Ghana card as well, linked to your passport. That is the formalization of the economy w in place. Yeah. As easy as that? No, I'm coming. It's, these are steps. You Be, need because to... the statistical service says, look, 27% um, of us are taking care of 73% of the rest of the I don't nation. have any challenge so at all. So how do we rope in the 73%? Now, it is two steps like this. The foundational blocks that are being set up. Mm -hmm. Once you have all of these in place, it gets to a point where you can link all of this data together and formalize the economy. You know that with this uh, interoperability... Me, so the ladies can... You know that with the interoperability that has come into play, for example, mobile money transactions are growing and in essence I mean you can say that it has become a mini bank account of a sort mm -hmm. we can argue about that but I'm just saying a mini and I'm referring on the word the, mini the, bank account. The, the Minister for Communication says we are paying more for CST to get cyber security and yet we are paying Kelly GVG millions of cities every month. The monies that to are being paid, the monies that are being paid, I, I like the question that you have asked and I would want you to take this issue up with the communication, Ministry of no, Communications. No, you tell me you are a government functionary. Oh, but the I fact that I'm a government functionary doesn't mean that I operate everywhere. <laughs> but, but you are the and, one telling and, me operability. And, 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 and I'm telling you that so. in terms, no, hold on. 
I'm telling you that the interoperability has come to serve as a means of at least getting some formal structure in terms of banking across board. And I'm saying that it flowing, is, flowing out of that, there are I don't security have, concerns. If you are allow me to and land. We are paying Kelly GVG a lot of money no challenge to ensure at all. security. Mm -hmm. Now we're being told that the increase of the communication service tax is also to get us to secure the space. I'm saying, what are we paying Kelly GVG to I do? don't have any challenge at all, okay. but as, 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 as Hughes, you know very well how to address these questions. And I'm very sure that in recent publications, the Ministry of Communications has attempted to answer all of these questions. See, there are further questions, you can direct it at them. However, the general picture, which is a fact, is that these challenges have existed with us for a very long time. But this government is tackling them and tackling them head on. We are not claiming that we've solved all of these the problems. The tax exemptions, let's talk about that quickly. One minute, sorry about that. And it's it's unfortunate on. that I never really get to land because on you're any going of my back. You're going back. I'm not to going anywhere. I'm just third, making a point. You're, for the third time, you're going to tell me that you have not solved all the problems and you're making steps. I don't want you to repeat yourself. I'm not repeating I'm, myself, so, but so, if, you, if you keep raising counter issues on every point that I make without allowing me to get to where I okay. want to get to, so, you always leave me so hanging. So let's talk about the main issue, the tax Which exemptions. Is, mm -hmm. The tax exemptions... Um, for those who bring foreign direct investments into this country, mm -hmm. the ESA is saying that, look, it, it doesn't help us to, to mobilize funds locally. It doesn't help us to be self-sufficient. It doesn't help us to stand on our feet and make, so you need to make certain bold decisions. What do you say to that as government? Well, Rep? I think that it's an issue of a chicken and an egg, really. We're in a very competitive space where, you know, even take the West African subregion, for example, oil and gas alone. Nigeria is a very big producer, proven record among mm -hmm. others. Uh, you have Cote d'Ivoire, mm -hmm. you have Ghana, you have others. So when we decide that we're going to look for investors, it's the same pool of investors who have the money that all of us are competing for. Mm -hmm. To the investor, he has the advantage of having his money. It is he who gives him the best benefits that he's going to go out there okay. and invest in. Now, we have, for example, um, internationally, we have tax havens that have been established that uh, attract people to make, bring their companies there, bring their monies there. The international offshore bases that have also been established just to ensure that financial transactions go. So which do we want to undertake as a country? Do we want to put in a regime that makes it attractive for them to come? And then when they come and they begin produce, we slowly... Mm. begin to extract more from them in terms of the benefits. And the benefits may not just be in terms of uh, direct capital investment or direct capital injection, but mm. it may also be in terms of work. It may also be in terms of services. There were other ex benefits attached to it. Or we just want to go forward, upfront. Um, we're not going to give any more exemptions. We want to just Th Those we give the exemptions to, do we ask them to specifically perform the detail within the deal we reach with them? employing a certain number of people, uh, paying taxes, SNIT and all of that, um, uh, making sure that they have manufacturing plants here and all. Do we, do we enforce those ones? There because there have been a lot of concerns about um, some of our brothers and sisters from the Lebanese communities and all of that, who just work with people for three, six months. They call them casual workers. They pay no SNIT for them. They sack them and get a new crop of people. And they are getting tax exemptions. We expect that our people will benefit from it. And yet, when you go and report them, there are officials at Slit who go and chook you and say, you are the one who came to report, and they suck you. I've yes. worked in a factory before, in a biscuit factory before. I used to pack biscuits in a biscuit factory, so I know what I'm talking about. These are concerns that are ongoing, but I also want to point your attention to, I think in the Daily Graphic, there was a story about two or three days ago where the Ghana Revenue Authority, I think there was a biscuit company, Dada Biscuit Company or so, that belongs to some Chinese where they were engaged in all sorts of activities, but then the monitoring and, and intelligence gathering was also ongoing and we had been able to impound you know, some two vehicles belonging to them, we realized that they were engaging in VAT undercutting and mm -hmm. under declaring, and the necessary processes are, are, are underway. Like I said, it all goes to show that there is a mechanism in place that okay. should give us the results we're looking okay. for. Okay. However, maybe we need to also investigate and review hmm. all of these processes that are in place because I, I have worked at the Ghana Revenue Authority before right. and I can tell you that it is not an easy thing. The, 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 the quantum of work that has to be done mm. as against even just the manpower 
ignore all other resources. Just the manpower to be able to do that is, is, is not Recruit easy. more people. There are people who have gone to Legon to study accounting and finance. Recruit them. There is, there is no challenge <laughs> with that. But you can imagine. that. Okay. Look, at, look at our national budget vis-a-vis -vis what we're saying. Uh, let's allow the ladies to have a bike. <laughs> Gabriela, you, let's do a quick mop-up uh, and then we'll come to Auntie Rhoda and then we'll wrap up. You, you have a few concerns to raise? Well, he, he, he spoke a lot, but he was very low on answers on mm -hmm. why on why why we have um but anyway you know <laughs> this planting for job thing i mean we've spent uh, we've already invested a lot in planting for jobs fertilizers right. fine there are two hundred thousand farmers employed in the sector and mm -hmm. all that but my issue with planting for jobs okay. is when he says that it doesn't cover every produce mm. we know that basic produce like corn right is under the planting for food mm. program mm. have you seen a bowl of kinky lately how does it look like oh my god i mean for once the kinky used to be enough to satisfy me mm. this morning i probably work. should have had two <laughs> because okay. it was like half of what and it's all leaves, very little dough. Maybe your appetite has increased. <laughs> no, it's the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the actual product. Okay. It's big on leaves and very small on corn dough. It's fraud. Why, why is that that's so? That's fraudulent. It's fraudulent. Yeah. And that's probably because the corn is not available. <laughs> because if it was readily available, okay. then prices should come down mm -hmm. so they can produce more kinky, right. bigger sizes kinky. So if it's actually shrinking, mm -hmm. that should tell you that the cost of producing the kinky has gone up. How so? Planting for food and jobs. So where's your product? One of your colleague radio um, TV stations has a program that goes to the market to allow mm. traders mm. to advertise their wares. Right. And every time I'm hearing the cattle came from Burkina, the tomato mm. came from uh, Nigeria, mm. the cereal is Nigerian, beans Nigerian. And I'm thinking, so where's the planting for food and jobs produce? Mm. It should come to bear in the market. Right. It should be readily available. You sh it, it, also, it should also bring down prices because if we're producing it here and it's affordable, why, 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 why should the products be expensive? Okay, Auntie Ruda, let's do a mop up and then we'll yeah, jump on to another I just wanted to topic. say right. that okay. every government pays contractors. Every government, there's always a follow up. Okay. If NPP should lose this um, coming elections, mm -hmm. the next government will pay contractors. It's not something that they are the only ones doing. Okay. Everybody pays contractors. And I'm surprised um, about the food and um, planting for food and jobs because you, you took credit for plantain, even though it was not part of the planting for food and jobs. But when it came, you had, you know, a whole president went and said, we're even exporting. exporting we had in excess, right. we're even exporting. So you should take all of it. So if there's no maize and there's no gari and there's no this, you should accept it because for the ordinary Ghanaian, that's the way we understand it. Planting for food and jobs means everything that we eat in the market, you are in charge of it. Um, talking about the roads right. and paying contractors. Contractors, right. Um, the rain has kind of like um, exposed us. So I'm asking, are we doing priority roads or are we doing particular roads? Good question. You know? Because the priority roads are the roads that are going to go in there, the food producing areas, and bring the food if there is any. But just doing roads linking from one residential area to the other, what we are seeing, mm -hmm. is not helping us. So if we're going to actually say that we are going to protect the public purse, mm -hmm. let us start by reducing the number of ministers now. It's, it's <sighs> important that we do. Let us stop also um, going by private jets, we can do that. We still get the same results if we go by the jets that we have or we go with a commercial airline. We can still get the same thing because all these expenses come to bear on us and we are not seeing the fruits because we are not seeing the investors. The investors are not coming because of our insanitary conditions and our, the, the way our country is looking now. So let us be, let's, let's be realistic. Let us say that things are not going well and therefore, we, we are trying to sort things out. Mm. But let's not think that because it's on paper, 
then everything is fine. It isn't. If the ordinary Ghanaian doesn't feel whatever you are saying Don't in his pocket. Tax fatigued. <laughs> okay, thank you. And uh, one particular road that has caught my attention over time is the Eastern Corridor Road. It's nearly been mentioned in every budget since I started shaving as, as though it were a new project that is coming up. They mention it, Eastern Corridor Road. I'm sure next year they will mention it again, Eastern Corridor Road. Every, every government it's mentioned been mentioned. Everybody's been mentioning it. The West region. Eastern Corridor Road. Eastern Corridor Road. Well, and it never gets stuff. done. Anyway, um, let's talk about the floods and how they have caused havoc. We're told in Accra and Kumasi, we have lost some, some lives, some 12 children. But I want us to look at it from the perspective of the National Disaster Management Organization, NADMO. And if I read uh, the NADMO's functions to you, one, it is to uh, the, the rehabilitation service for victims of disaster. That's what, one. Two, mobilization of people at various levels of society to support government programs. Three, ensuring preparedness of the country in the management of disasters. Four, coordinating the activities of various governmental and non-governmental agencies in the management of disasters. The organization's mandate include response to earthquake, floods, and rainstorms, and market fires, etc., etc. Um, Nana, let me ask you, let's do a holistic, um, if you like, audit of NADMO. Have they satisfied these requirements from where you sit? <coughs> number one, having had training as a security personnel, and number two, working in government now, and number three, on the back of the fact that we know that NADMO has been padded over the years since it began with party padded, boys and mean? girls. Pa padded because uh, we know that it is largely job for the boys and girls. And if you do an employee audit one on one, to work in the army, you need a certain skill. To work at GRE, you need a certain skill. To sit here, you need a certain skill. What do you need to work with NADMO? And do we check those ones? So I'm asking you to do an audit of it. And I'm saying this because, I'm saying this because whether, we, whether we accept it or not, we know that party boys and girls are put in there. So let, let me which, hear your verdict. Which parties boys and girls? I, I think that... You know, For both framing, of you. I think the framing of your question is a bit too opinionated, if, if you will allow me. Because of what I saw, look, and let me premise it. In 2015, when the June 3 disaster broke, I was at Nkrumah Circle, and I have a documentary on YouTube titled Filled, Flood, and Fire. I saw people die. The guys who came from NADMO, who were coming to, to rescue the guys who were perishing, sat in the bus, and they were giving off surgical gloves to the carpet sellers to go and rescue the guys who were perishing. These were guys in NADMO shirts and reflectors, and I dare anybody to say I'm telling lies. I was there. I was there right from the evening because I just closed from Rundown at yeah. nine thirty, and I was there till five a.m. and I went back onto TV Africa to do. Until Rudan knows and, I, I used and, to work. And, and my Africa. question is: so that showed there were party boys. I'm just asking. Nobody has denied it that there's party boys, unless you want to say there are no party. boys. I don't know. That's why I'm asking you. Okay. You are. You are you there are, are no party them. boys in that. I haven't. Said, I'm, I, you are the, the one. There are no party boys in that. Is that a question? Yes, that is a question. Okay. The question. My answer to you hmm. is that the premise you gave me, I'm unaware of. Okay. And so if you are the one making that assumption, clearly, fine. We may have to I'm asking you, my major question is for you to run an assessment of NADMO. And I've given you the four pointers that NADMO is supposed to look at. Shall I repeat it? Please do. Okay. One, NADMO is supposed to conduct a rehabilitation service for victims of disasters, which means counseling and all other things. Number two, mobilization of people at various levels of society to support governmental programs. Three, ensuring the preparedness of the country in the management of disasters. Four, conducting the activities uh, of various governmental and non-governmental agencies in the management of disasters. And the organization's mandate include the response to earthquake floods and rainstorms and market fires and etc. Okay. Now, I think that largely, um, under the given conditions, and I would want to say the successive governments have all complained that NADBO hasn't been necessarily very well funded. Mm. And so under the conditions, I think that they have done what they can. That's not to say that we should accept the standards as they exist today, you know, to, 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 to be good enough. We need to find ways and means of ensuring that we resource them to be able to do better. The current situation we have with the flooding, there are various ways of looking at it. I, I, I was uh, told of a very interesting perspective yesterday, and this is what it is. For example, when you go into the, the slums, 
people are constructing makeshift kiosk and all of that in the mm. water areas. Mm. And some of the municipal and district chief executives are struggling with making the decision to suck them from where they are. Because you, you go into a kiosk and there's a mother, there's a father, and there are six children in that kiosk. And their whole world is in that kiosk, which and has been constructed. Way. Which has been constructed. And they are in and, harm's way. Which has been constructed on a waterway yeah. or something like right. that. Now, getting them to actually accept your position before you move them is, is one major issue. And the stubbornness that they display is another issue. Over the years, what we have done is that we have allowed these things to go on and it is contributing to um, the situation that we find ourselves in currently. Mm. What really I think should be done is we need to draw a line at a certain point and be able to take the hard decisions that have to be taken. The other side of it is also the seemingly wealthy and powerful who know very well that this, what I'm doing is wrong, but because they have enough money to go around, they're able to pay their ways out of it and then create disturbances and problems for all of us. I'm told of a very sad story in the Ashanti region. I think Honorable Collins of Uzoamanque's constituency. Twelve where children. Lit, yeah. In the Ashanti region, generally, is 12. But in the last time that he reigned, little child of about 11 years lost his or her life just because... People have done the wrong things over the period there of time. There was one who was younger, actually, I think about some eight, nine years. We so reported yesterday. it gets back to this issue of our own perceptions and attitude, critically. Yes, NADMO is there. Yes, NADMO has to help us manage the disasters. But how about not creating the disasters in the first place? How about ensuring that that person who, the district planning officer, mm. who has been mandated to go around and ensure that people stick according to the plans that they bring mm. are actually able to stick according to those plans. The reality is, look, NADMO doesn't have that kind of power. So they would not get involved until there's already a disaster. How about making NADMO a proper emergency response unit like happens in the UK, US, where NADMO is not an offshoot of government, but NADMO becomes a real... When you real... say an offshoot of government... You see. And, and you are a security person, so I, I expect you to understand no, this but one. Your framing of it as so, an offshoot so, of government. So, so NADMO, and, and I am insisting that NADMO is padded with party boys and girls, whether you accept it or not. That's but I, but I'm saying that elsewhere, it is an emergency response unit that either is under fire service or is under the military or is under the police department. People are giving requisite training, say three months paramilitary training. People are giving proper paramedic training to make sure that they are well trained and they go to work with pride. So the National Ambulance Service and all of that are lumped together and they become a disaster management organization. Have we gotten to that point where we need to take that decision and say we are pushing it? Because I've not seen anybody being trained as a NADMO official prim and proper. I have seen people trained for the National Ambulance Service and giving uniforms. And so when somebody falls down, they know exactly what to do. In our case for NADMO, I have not seen that before. Even who gets to head NADMO is a problem. And that's what I'm asking us to look at okay. again, because the floods will come one more time. I do believe that they are given some form of, 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 of training. I don't know exactly how vast it is or what form of training it is, but I do believe that they have been given or they get some form of training. I associate myself partly with some of the statements that you are seeking to make as to the resourcing of it. Because, for mm -hmm. example, if the resources are abundant enough, then the sort of training that you are speaking about. I disagree with your proposal that it should be put under either the military or any of these organizations. I think it should be a standalone organization that has, is properly equipped, that has enough staff, that has all the necessary equipment that they need to be able to work. That I agree with you on. Maybe, yes, your point about making it a proper emergency response service, yes. It is supposed to be an emergency response service. We may all argue about, and I think, I think opinions around this table is will be it, the same. Is it, as we speak, do you see it as an emergency response service? He's, I was getting this, so if you had just allowed me. What I said is, I don't think that opinions around this table would differ on the fact that that is what it was meant to be. However, I also think we all agree that it is not what we meant it to be currently. There's no, there's no disagreement around and that. And what, what would be the cost, apart from resources? <laughs> <laughs> Successively, we have not dedicated enough resources no, to I'm, the organization. I'm saying beyond resources. What would be the other causative, causative agent? If you know any, please let me know. But I am saying that successfully, or successively, we haven't dedicated enough resources to it. We should have perhaps been seeing you know, quite a lot of 
training on these refresher courses, giving them enough vehicles, giving them enough you know, stores to, to be able to work with. I don't think that that is the current situation as we have it. What we see is that it goes, you know, something, a disaster happens. They go out there, they give blankets, they give roofing sheets, they give uh, this, they give Sometimes that, they give that. food. Well, they give this, That's they give that. Also. They give this, they give that. And then over time, the disaster goes away. I'm not even sure of whether they have counseling services right. available. That's their first but, mandate, by the way. But, but we should all come to an agreement with ourselves and move on. But for me, the major emphasis will be let's pre prevent the kind of disasters that we can prevent. An earthquake, well, maybe we can't do anything about earthquake. But basic things like flooding, due to the fact that we are dumping refuse into, into our gutters, or we are constructing buildings where we don't have to construct buildings. And we know, because okay. we have sat down to plan our societies. Okay. Those we should do away with first, mm. before we then you know, even think about the fact that because we've created these disasters, mm. let's find more money. To, to, to help assuage the damage that comes from okay, these disasters. Okay, thank you. Gabriela will take a bite, but I've seen a very funny picture of uh, people trying to show us that even the UK floods, they don't build in waterways, they don't throw rubbish around. So don't compare yourself with them. If you stop it, we won't have flooding. Yes, madam, what do you think? Not more. Do we need to look at it again? What do we need to we, do? We, we, we seriously need to look at it again. In terms of its formation, its um, manpower, but as you rightly observed, it is a dumping ground for political upright cheeks. Mm. The current administration is trying to defend their cause, mm. but I mean, you have to, you know. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> no. Allow him, allow, allow him to yeah. make it. I'm just saying, but she because hits me. From and that's the presidency, I mean, from, sorry, from the leadership of mm. Nadmo, mm. who's Abu Ramadan? He's a political activist. And what has he done within the emergency response space? What experience does he even have in emergency response? You come that there's a gentleman who comes to your show, um, Barbara's George husband. George exactly, his communication for, for them. <laughs> what experience do they have in emergency response? And there's a litany of government communicators who actually come from the NADMO, NADMO mm. department. Mm. We have to sort that thing out because, you see, emergency response is a professional and is a scientific endeavor. Mm. When lives are at stake, you don't just as you said, when you meet an ambulance service, the attendant on the ambulance mm. has already been trained in basic health care. Mm. They know how to resuscitate a patient. Right. They know how to apply first aid. Right. What does NADMO currently operatives know? We wait for the disaster to strike, and then we go and distribute rice, blankets, as you said, oil, fish sheets, oil, tin tomatoes. It's as if we're just waiting for disasters to strike so we can go and offer gifts. But the actual planning to avert the disaster mm. is what we are very short on. That more is in almost all the district assemblies. Right. It's decentralized. That's right. So why don't they work with the assemblies? Why are they not more proactive? Work with the assemblies, knowing that we are entering the rainy season. Mm. These are the rain prone areas. We have to do the silting. We have to go and um, embark on a sanitation campaign to clean our streets mm. up. We have to sensitize. Uh, communities mm. that with the oncoming rains don't sweep and leave it out in they the open for the wind. That 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 is a stopgap measure mm. during a disaster. But whose house are you moving to? <laughs> we're going to wait at the terminal. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Antonio, take a bite on yes, this or final I, and let's, I, and let's... I think that the two political parties have always used um, NADMO as mm. a dumping ground. Yes, yeah. party boys. Uh, yeah, yes. party boys. Yes. They, they, they all use them. And at the end of it, you know, when it even gets to... Um, I think on this one, they agree. Yeah, they you. agree, yeah. And when it even gets to, to that, disaster management and there's that. a disaster, you, it will <laughs> surprise you. It right. will surprise you that the, the members of NADMO actually do it on party lines sometimes. Mm. Mm. So you actually get relief items going to party members first. Really? Yes, it does. It happens. They know who their members so, are. So in the Upper East now, yeah. now they have flooding oh, in the Shanti region. They, know who they will who. take the NADBO relief items and give it to party people yes. first. Yes. yes, they will look wow. out for the party people first before other people. It's, it's something that is there. Um, and so I think that they need to be trained properly. I think that we have to depoliticize the, mm. the, 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 the NADMO. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that we should equip them more. Okay. Um, unfortunately, when they do get their resources, mm -hmm. it, it becomes handy during elections. Um, because somehow they, they, they use them mm. also as part of their electioneering uh, campaign.
campaign material, right. which is not supposed to be the case. Mm -hmm. But if we look at the floods and stuff like that, I was surprised a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. when the um, vice president visited Agoboshi Market, right. um, Sodom and Gomorrah, or mm. Old Fadama, as we call it, and actually said that he was not thinking of moving them and that they were going to try and um, uh, make things better for them in that mm. enclave. And I was surprised. I, I thought that under President Muhammad they were moved, some were giving money and, 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 and buses that to, go it, back. to go yes. back. Yes. Uh, so that was what surprised me that we're trying, you know, we are killing that, um, is it Odona? Yes, of it? yes, yes, yes. Yeah. The Odor River. The Odor River. The we Kuali. are killing it, the Kole. We're killing it with uh, 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 ICT remnants, mm. you know, sawdust. and all, sawdust, mm -hmm. and everything else is in there and then we are trying to move these people and then you go there telling them that you're going to you are not going to move them you're going to actually now give them uh, uh, facilities like uh, washrooms proper washrooms and places like that and i ask myself does he really know what he's talking about because this river is definitely getting dead and not more than maybe a couple of years back that place was green yeah had a, we had a you regatta know? there once yeah we had a regatta there once and not only that but um, less than about 10 years ago, the place was dredged. We had greenery on the, on the shoulders, mm -hmm. you know. And that was how come even um, uh, Professor Frimpo and Watine had moved the, the coffin the manufacturers and yes, stuff like yes, that, if yes. you remember. Mm -hmm. And that place was really beautiful. Now, that place has become another uh, uh, dumping ground. Okay. And you, you, you just stand there and say that. This is, why do you say that? Tell them that you move them. If they'll vote for you, they'll vote for you. But for the rest of us, we want that place to be nice again. We want it to be able to have clean flowing water mm. into the sea. Th th these are some of the things. I, I, I'm, I'm hurt because we spend state resources too. And I remember the, the police officer who said he was not running away, but he was running. I forgot his name. <laughs> he, so so he said he was not running away, but he was in fact running away. We spent money to move them. We spent money to compensate them. Yes. We spent money to hire buses for and them. And then we, we come and back and then it's the same thing. We use them for politics. But, Don't worry. but here's, I want to we'll, say something. We will be um, fine. Don't worry. About the, the the, the um Harriet says my time is up. <laughs> oh yeah, Harriet, just one minute. I just want to say that yes, we agree that Gritco has to um remove people from mm. under their pylons, but could they please do it with a human face? Okay. Because babies, a baby was actually killed in oh, one of these things because the baby was sleeping in there, the mother was not there, and these bulldozers just went and lifted everything and that was it. Wow. At, you know, it, it's not right. Do it with a human face. What did this happen? Um over the weekend. Where? Um, Where? America House area and then ah, Trasaco. Yes. Trasaco, yes, okay. Asa, okay. Um, around That's the Trasaco yes. place, the That's demolition. True. It was really Thank bad. You. Yes, the American House demolition. It actually happened last Thursday or so, Wednesday, Thursday. A baby died. Um, okay, say again. A baby died. Yes. In fact, three people, I'm, I'm told three people, they came to my house because they know I, I do politics, so they came to my house. Yeah, you're a big woman, so um, people will come. Say that again. They, they'll come with school fees you know? as well. <laughs> Nana Damwa is a member of the MPP's communication team. Nana, thank you very much for your time. Gabriela Tete speaks for the NDC as well, Madam. Thank you very much. And Madam Rodling Imorayana is a former vice uh, chairperson of the CPP. We'll see you after the